Journalist Kevin Roos recently wrote an article about himself and his phone entitled, Do Not Disturb, How I Ditched My Phone and Unbroke My Brain. He begins the article by saying, my name is Kevin and I have a phone problem. His phone, which many of these phones, these smartphones do uh, these days, tracks the amount of hours that uh, you spend on your phone every day. Uh, at least on my phone, it gives you a report today on Sunday of how, how you've done over the last week. And, and Kevin realized he had an issue when that number was consistently coming up over five hours. As a matter of fact, he was averaging five hours and 37 minutes a day on his phone. And that's when he said, I need help. So he hired a phone coach, Catherine Price, who authored the book, How to Break Up with Your Phone, a 30-day guide on eliminating bad phone habits. The first thing she encouraged him to do was put a rubber band around his phone and then on uh, the lock screen of his phone, write three questions. What for? Why now? And what else? And he began to, as, as he pulled his phone out of his pocket, it was a reminder to him of those questions and that rubber, touching that rubber band reminded him, hey, do I really need to pull my phone out? right now. Uh, he said, mostly I became aware of how profoundly uncomfortable I am with stillness. If I was going to repair my brain, I needed to practice doing nothing. So in that time that he stopped pulling out his phone on commutes, he began to notice his surroundings more and and people, and how interesting things were that were happening around him. Another thing he did to detox was he went on a 48-hour retreat without his phone in the Catskills in New York. He said this, I basked, I basked in 19th century leisure, feeling my nerves softening and my attention span stretching back out. Isn't that great? I read books. I did crossword puzzles. I lit a fire and looked at the stars. Well, at the end of his 30-day detox, he had reduced that five hours and 37-minute average to just over an hour a day. And he concluded by saying, it's not a full recovery. I'll have to stay vigilant. Indeed, he will. But for the first time in a long time, I'm starting to feel like a human again. Hmm. Roos had a 30-day guide on eliminating bad phone habits. We, as Christians, have a 40-day period called Lent, where we're encouraged to do, I'll, I'll sum it up in three things, to remember our mortality, our humanness, and in that humility, begin to return, turn around, and, and move towards God. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, encourage ourselves to greater habits of faith practice in our life. Well, Moses had uh, 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God on Mount Sinai, but unlike Roos and his phone, he wasn't Moses wasn't trying to stop bad habits, at least in himself, maybe with the Israelites. But he had returned his focus to creating good habits. And by focusing on God, Moses was transformed in the spiritual heart, but also physically. You know, sometimes 
we're of dual minds with Christianity. I think sometimes we say Christianity is so easy. <laughs> and we do that, uh, I think, when, when folks are first being introduced to it. And we primarily talk about grace. We say it's no work. As a matter of fact, you can't earn God's love. It is God's free gift to you. There's nothing you can do other than accept this great gift of grace. But the other side of the story, and those of you who have been on this journey for a long time, surely know this, that Christianity is hard work if we're really to live it out. In our head, we know that God's grace is sufficient. But in our spiritual lives and in our lives every day where everybody wants to make us work hard to earn things, it takes a lifetime to figure out how to accept this grace and be transformed into new creations by this grace. And so it is hard work. It takes carving out time to invest ourselves in reading and being with other people and going to classes and contemplating what it is to be a disciple of Christ, to really understand this grace and follow it. And I think Moses can teach us about the good hard work that it takes and I go back to what I said at the beginning. He is on the foot of the mountain, and this time God says, you know what, Moses, I want you to do? Before you start coming up that mountain, I want you to carve in stone these tablets, these notepads. I want you to make this blank slate that I'm going to give you information for. And who knows how long it took Moses at the foot of that mountain to carve that's those stones. And it didn't stop there. He carved, and when he was done, and, and it's amazing to me that the scriptures just fly by this. I'm so glad Susan talked about hiking because Moses had to carry those stone tablets up the mountain. <laughs> Can you imagine? I, as I was thinking about this, I was envisioning how does that work exactly? Did he lift him up and put him up ahead of him and take a few steps and then lift him up again? Did he have him under his arms? Did he have a satchel on his back? He carried the weight, the weight of, of those notepads, those blank slates that were waiting to be filled up the mountain. He did the hard work to get into God's presence. Carved and carried. And then once he was up there for 40 days in the presence of God, it's a very anthropomorphic image of God. It says God stood with Moses. And then God said, this is who I am, asserted clearly who God was. And Moses humbled himself. And then, and it's really interesting, at the beginning of 34, God says, you, you carve out those stone tablets and I'll write on them. Well, something changed by the time Moses got up there, and you heard it in the scriptures, that God says, you know what, I'm going to tell you what the commandments are, <laughs> and I want you to chisel them in. <laughs> so for the next 40 days, Moses chisels into those tablets the commandments that God gave him, spent time with God's word painstakingly putting the word in there. Do you think he knew that word by the end of it? Oh, yeah. And then he comes down the mountain. And it's great. He gets down the mountain. And can you imagine? Uh, he, he, he doesn't know anything's changed about him. Other than he's exhausted. He had to carry those tablets down again. He carried again. I don't know about y'all, but for me at this age and stage, going down a mountain is a lot harder than going up. It's hard on these old knees carrying, carrying stone tablets on top of it. 
But when Aaron and the Israelites see him, they are frightened. And they have to tell Moses, hey, you know what? You are shining. You are shining. And this is scary. And they probably knew, hey, we were off base worshiping the golden calf. Something has happened here that is significant. We better pay attention. Carve, carry, chisel, shine. Carve, carry, chisel, shine. Say it with me. Carve, carry, chisel, shine. Again. One more time. Phil will sign you up for the choir. That's the first step to singing. You know, as I was thinking about that mantra this week, I thought about college and the old Waffle House in Burlington, North Carolina, when I ordered hash browns. I'll have them scattered, covered. What did I have them as? Scattered, covered, something, and chunked. (laughs) It's kind of like that mantra. Carve, carry, chisel, shine. Our faith takes effort, good effort, and work and investment. Lent is an intentional time to do that, to do our version of carving and carrying and chiseling out our faith, spending time with God, focusing on the vessel that will carry God's word, that will know it, and that will eventually reflect it if we invest. By spending more time with the practices of our faith, we may reflect the light of Christ more. If you drop something during the 40 days of Lent, if you get rid of a few things, Make sure that a part of your Lent is adding something back and make sure that something is investing in you being carved and you carrying and you chiseling so that you will eventually shine. Amen.